Hey everyone. All right, I am back after taking a little hiatus. Here, jumping into Jacques Derrida's dissemination, which I'm going to cover over three parts. I'm going to explain how I'm going to divide them up as I go through here, but a few other things to say. So in order for me to keep doing this, I think I'm going to try to introduce ads into the podcast. Now, don't fear if they actually do happen, which is no guarantee, uh, there'll be very few of them. So it's still a while before that'll actually become a reality. So hang tight, it'll all be fine. Uh, but eventually that might happen in order to supplement myself and to be able to do this more frequently or to do this uh, for an extended period of time. So I'm not forced to take up other employment that would take me away from this. Obviously, I can't do this forever, but We'll try to prolong it as long as I can. Now, before jumping into this text, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. Hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. If you have a friend who has trouble sleeping at night, I'm sure I can help put them to sleep with my soothing voice. I try not to scream too often to... Uh, create too many disturbances. But in any case, if you want to help me out, do all those things, you know, tell your friends and family. Uh, you can like, share, subscribe. That helps out a lot. If you're listening to this in podcast form on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you can leave reviews, any good review will help. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. And yeah, I don't want to keep uh, going on about that stuff. Let's jump into this incredibly difficult text called Dissemination. And my goal here is to help you understand Derrida. After you listen to this, you're going to understand Derrida. At least, I hope. Now, this text is broken into three chapters, one of which is a, an extended preface. And each one of those chapters I'm going to cover in the three episodes that I do on this. So the first one is going to cover this very enigmatic preface that is, by and large, a challenge to the idea of the preface or the preface's placement as a supplement to a text. The second part that I do, the second episode is gonna cover the first chapter technically, which is on Plato's pharmacy, which is probably the one most people are gonna be interested in. So just, you gotta wait for that one. Uh, and then the third one I do is gonna be on the third chapter titled The Double Session, which really puts into practice what he had developed in the preface here and in the first chapter, and really puts them into practice to understanding uh, the work of Melalme specifically, uh, among others. Now, before even the preface here, there's a really important introduction. And I normally don't encourage people to read translators' introductions or editors' introductions because they will often only get an interpretation of the text, which can be helpful, but at times it can also lead people astray. Now, in this case, Barbara Johnson's translation and her introduction here are pretty important. So I'd really recommend you go and read it. it that is if you wanted to jump into this book because it, it will be very helpful for you but one of the central points that i want to take out of this translator's introduction is the way that johnson here barbara johnson points to derrida's play with language so as we will come to see throughout the course of this book derrida is trying to usurp the authority or the privilege often associated with speech over writing. He's trying to usurp this authority in order to say that there are many openings presented to us through writing, many different possibilities presented to us through writing. And so what we get is a pretty playful uh, demonstration here in Derrida's philosophy. Now, this is difficult to translate. So in Derrida's work, he makes a lot of, or he uses uh, many plays on words, or he plays on words using French words that are homonyms for one another to refer to more than one thing, and that is lost in translation. And that's, Johnson can't do anything about that, and any point in the text where that comes up, she will make a note of it and highlight how uh, the play on words is lost. Now, the reason she brings this up is to show that Derrida is doing more than just describing something. He's very much living it in trying to realize this possibility for writing that has been constantly repressed and oppressed by various mechanisms meant to sequester it in favor of speech. And that puts us here into 
the first chapter, I dare call it the first chapter, uh, that is titled Outwork Prefacing, in which Derrida wants us to rethink of the role of the preface as something that is meant to act as a supplement to a text. And this might be something we all think of, or we can maybe all agree with tentatively, that a preface is meant to stand outside of a text. It is meant to be read, maybe not to be read. Maybe it's meant to situate a text within a certain socio-historical moment to explain the impetus behind the text, to lay out the text's conclusions beforehand, to give the reader a sense of its trajectory. It might do any of those things. It might do all of those things. And in the history of philosophy that Derrida points out, this idea of the preface has often been subordinated to the text itself, as though it stands outside of the text. Now, in this book, in Dissemination, this preface, or this outwork prefacing chapter, is the length of a chapter. And this is important, because Derrida is trying to imagine the preface as not a supplement to a text, but rather as very much a part of it. Now, as we will go on here, we're going to even problematize this idea of the text, and we're going to problematize this idea of the supplement, or being outside of the text. Now, in this process, Derrida makes it very clear that he uses this language just because he knows that the reader is going to understand what he means when he refers to a text or the text's supplement in the term of a, in terms of like a preface. Now, with that being said, he lays out very clearly that he is just using that for the sake of um, to facilitate that communication, which we can then begin to interrogate and to deconstruct. Now, for those that are curious more about Derrida's work, I have covered other, his other texts, some of his other texts, including of Grammatology and Structure, Sign, and Play. I think that's it. And I've done a few other videos on him. You can go and find those uh, on this channel or wherever you're listening to this. You'll be able to find that. But Derrida here is very much playing with these words in order to use them against themselves. And he'll often put words in quotations to refer not to... Uh, the thing itself, but rather to the thing as being um, as almost challenging the way that that thing has often been characterized within this tradition, one that he traces back to the Greeks, talking about Western uh, metaphysics, the Western history of philosophy really more generally. Now, one of his really, at least to me, one of his really brilliant ob observations from Of Grammatology, which is I think his first full-length book, is that there is no bedrock to meaning when we are dealing with language. So when we deal with language, we are all going to have different ideas about how that language is going to manifest itself in our mind's eye. So if I say the word tree, two different listeners are going to have very two different mental images of what the word tree will signify. Now, two someone who is not a Derridian, that mental image is going to stand in for what might be a pure form of the idea of treeness. That is what binds all of our mental images together in the form of a tree. But a Derridian will say, well, is there such a thing? Is there that kind of unitary understanding of a tree that subtends or exists underneath everybody else's differing understandings of the tree. Now, Derrida says that not quite, because when I say, for instance, if I say the word tree, it will evoke a mental image in someone's mind that will invoke perhaps other memories as well. But that image of the tree that comes up into one's mind's eye is going to be comprised of any number of other images, any number of other histories, which are themselves going to be bound up in their own uh, their own illustration in that mind's eye that's going to have its own understanding as well. So what we end up with when we are dealing with this thing called signification or language is an endless play of difference where no given word has meaning in and of itself, but rather it only has meaning in relation to other words. That is, it can only exist within a certain economy of meaning that has been established 
largely, of, of course, culturally, socially, historically, has given it some meaning. So the word dog, D-O-G, means virtually nothing anywhere outside of specific contexts. And it only gains its meaning because it is not the word cat, or it is not the word tree, or it is not the word sky, or whatever. So in order for any word to actually point to a mental image or to invoke or evoke a mental image depends as much on what it does not signify as what it does signify in the mind's eye or in our brains. So there is not, and this is really that smart observation from a grammatology, underneath all representation, underneath all language, is not what he calls a transcendental signified that will exist there for everybody if we just dug down deep enough into, uh, into representation or into language. In fact, all we will ever end up with is more of this chain of signification. So it'll just lead on endlessly to different things that signify, different words that signify others, different symbols that signify others, and so on ad infinitum, that is, forever, pretty much. Now, despite this, what I will say, maybe brazenly, this truth of all representation, that is, there is no real transcendental signified, there is no real truth at the, at the core of it, despite this, there have been efforts to try and ground a certain realness underneath representation. So, and we're going to talk about this more in the next episode when we look at Plato's Pharmacy, but in the case of Plato, there's a belief that underneath writing, so the physical act of writing on a paper, is the possibility of real speech. And real speech is the, is the real enchilada. It's the real thing, whereas writing is just derivative to that real thing. And that thing is real because, you know, we can feel it and touch it and we can have, we can't talk, touch speech, but in order to have speech, you have to be in proximity to somebody else. There's a kind of a real connection there, apparently. Now, what Derrida says is that that is only another form of representation. That is, if I speak to somebody else and I am giving over to them all of my body language as well, there might be more for that person to chew on than if they just read words. I'm, I'm, and I put a big asterisk here around the word might. There might be more. But at the same time, all they are ever getting are just signs. When they hear language, they are just getting signs that they are, in their mind, that they are transforming into mental images, that they are transforming into their own understanding in order to comprehend them. If they see the other person's facial expressions, it's almost like they are reading a text as well. They are reading the text of the person's face. So even speech in this history of philosophy is itself despite being a thing that has been privileged as a more real, a more original kind of communication against writing, it is itself only another kind of text. It is itself and only another kind of writing. So the history of philosophy being rife with various distinctions, like the distinction between body and soul, between writing and speech, between, um, I don't know, you know, insert any number that you can here between East and West, whatever. So many different of these binary oppositions have been instituted, not necessarily to provide any kind of real distinction between two things, as in the case of like writing and speech that I've just, I think, pretty accurately demonstrated are two sides of the same, same coin instead of being opposites, so to speak. Uh, they are very much similar. Despite that, there have been efforts to try to ground all understanding or to ground all representation and understanding of that representation into easily digestible categories that can then provide a sense of, I guess, security. That underneath the uncertainty of writing is speech. Underneath the uncertainty of, and this is, you know, how often um, the body is framed, underneath this uh, kind of uncertainty of the body is the certainty of the mind or the thinking mind. And here we might think of Descartes, for example, where we can't be sure our bodies exist, but we can be sure because we are in the process of thinking that the mind exists. And that is the original unitary thing that keeps everything in check. It is that bedrock, that transcendental signified that cannot go away. 
But we just, you know, in the case of Descartes, we just need to turn to Kant to undo that, where Kant says, but Descartes, the only way you are able to have thinking as a faculty is purely by your having had experiences, bodily experiences in the world. So instead of saying that uh, thinking is the bedrock that it can't go away, Kant comes into the picture and says that, well, it's difficult to really say what necessarily comes first. You know, we really have experience. And we can't just do away with that and say that it is somehow derivative to thought. Experience is very much necessary, and the same with David Hume and so on, but this kind of a tangent here. My point is that the distinctions that have been created between these different binaries have largely been founded upon nothing. Yet within this cultural imagination, within this history, they have been very instrumental in motivating certain privilegings of speech overwriting, for example. The idea of discourse, of 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 dialectics, of a meeting between two different minds, at least in the way that Derrida constructs it, constructs it here in his criticism of Plato and Hegel, in the dialectic being this avenue towards truth, Derrida says, well, surely then the same thing can happen of writing, because anything that comes out of a, di of a dialectical interaction can be equated to, related to, what happens when a reader confronts a written text, and so on. So the very fact that these binaries are constructed without there necessarily being a true difference between them demonstrates the extent to which they always imply their undoing. That is, the logic of speech implies a kind of undoing of, uh, of writing, and the logic of writing implies an undoing of the logic of speech. And it is deconstruction that implies this and anticipates it to some extent or another. And before jumping into that, let's imagine here, let's craft out uh, an ad break. Now, I hope that wasn't too brutal. I have no idea what that, well, yeah, I will know what that would have been because I would have chosen it or permitted it to come on here. Uh, there probably would have been nothing, just a little pause. Hopefully that wasn't too jarring. Anyways, and deconstruction. So we're on to deconstruction here. Now, despite the fact that these binary oppositions always imply their own undoing, that is, speech not actually embodying the things that speech is believed to embody, and writing embodying more than it is believed to than it than it is believed to embody, because of that, they always imply their own undoing. They always imply their own deconstruction. Now this might, you know, to someone listening, <laughs> they might say, well, so what is Derrida saying then? If these things are always going to deconstruct themselves, what's the point? Why does he have to get involved? Well, this logic can be intensified in just what he's done. That is, in his own philosophy, is really bringing this to the forefront, demonstrating the extent to which these terms are dependent upon one another in order to make either of them tangible. That is, in the history of philosophy, the privileging of speech couldn't happen without the oppression or the repression of writing. So it was necessary to generate an antithetical other, even though this other, as I've already said, is very much connected to writing, very much, or sorry, very much connected to speech in the case of speech and writing, very much uh, resembles it. Despite that, there was an effort to try to undermine one in order to proffer up the other, to give a sense of stability, to give a sense of security to various interlocutors. That is, to make them think that they are actually arriving towards truth. And this was, again, one of, I think, really one of Kant's criticisms of dialectical reasoning uh, is that it can only get to a certain point. You can only go so far with it before it'll hit a barrier. And that barrier is going to be true of writing or uh, speech. That is, Kant, in, with written words, was able to demonstrate the limits of dialectical thinking by just putting out the arguments. That is, the thesis and the antithesis, and they're possible trueness of both or the possible falseness of both in words and it was no less true so to speak so the task of deconstruction is in his words essentially to disorganize to trouble the static difference between opposing terms to really bring to light how they are dependent upon one another and how they resemble one another now we turn to the preface the idea of the preface not we're, we're, we're already in the preface his preface but the idea of the preface here in the history of philosophy and 
literature and anything, as I've already said, has been as a supplement to the real text. It is just an addition to it. But there's a kind of mystery in the preface here, because the preface, as the term implies, comes before the text. But it is something written after the text, often written after the text, after someone has written their book, had time to, you know, really digest their own thoughts and to be able to sit down and summarize their book and to think about its implications in a certain context, like what it meant uh, for various other authors, how it was taken up, and, and so on. It is only after the fact that the preface can be written. And here as well, we get a kind of deconstruction of linearity. Here we have now a thing being written after the fact to come before the text. It is something that is meant to stand in for the text or to add to it, at least as it is understood in the history of philosophy. So the preface is that which always implies its own undoing by virtue of being a supplement. Because if you just read the text, ostensibly, you don't need the preface. That is, everything in the preface should be in the text if it's a proper preface. But nevertheless, it still holds an instrumental value. That is, it still has a purpose. And that purpose for Derrida is that the uh, preface's own self-effacement, the preface's, preface's is its own <laughs> position as addition or as supplement, is meant to give the text that it is the preface to, to give that text a sense of totality, a sense of completeness, a sense of, uh, of, of having uh, framed, being framed on either end, and being total in that way. And here he turns to Hegel as an example, and I don't know how many of you have read the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, and also prefaces to uh, the Greater Logic, or the Logic of Science of Logic, the logic I'm losing my mind right now. Uh, but in these prefaces, there's kind of a mysterious moment in, in all of them, when Hegel almost bemoans, or questions what the point of a preface really is. The preface for him is something that it, it seems as he's writing it, he's like, God, like, I have to write this? Like, I really have to write this right now? What is the point? Like, just read the text. Yet, he does it anyway. As though the preface, as something that is only a supplement, seems to be unavoidable, even to someone in this case, Hegel, someone who really doesn't like it. But maybe, just maybe, because the phenomenology of spirit came before the science of logic, could it be that the preface to the phenomenology of spirit is meant to hide the fact that the phenomenology of spirit is itself a kind of preface to the science of logic? That is, this believed to be complete thing is really only a supplement, an addition to the science of logic, the greater, uh, the greater logic, as it is colloquially called. And if that were the case, if the phenomenology of spirit is but only a preface to this extension, this, this follow-up, is it then necessary to see it as being maybe uh, motivating its own effacement? That is, implying its own undoing in its place only as an addition, only as a supplement to the science of logic. But the preface at the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit is all the more mysterious, given the kind of substance or the content of the phenomenology of spirit, where for those that don't know, here's the phenomenology of spirit in like 10 seconds. The phenomenology of spirit looks at very many different avenues, including botany, including the relationship between uh, serfs and, and lords, the relationship between uh, kings and, and publics, the formation of democracy, the um, introduction of various religions and what those religions necessarily mean in relationship to free individuals. He looks at all of these different spaces, looks in these spaces, these kind of crevices, these cracks, for what he just kind of calls, uh, or at least in the English translations, calls spirit. And almost at the end of it, it's revealed, or it isn't really revealed uh, conclusively, but you get the sense by the end of it that spirit is not to be found in any single one of these places per se. Rather, it is the very movement of the text itself. It is the very movement of history that is spirit. The very fact that he's looking at all of these different avenues implies that spirit has had 
this mutative effect that has been bouncing around. It has perhaps even motivated these kinds of developments and changes. It is the universe being one with itself in motivating its own uh, self-consciousness in the term and eventually leading to uh, religion essentially now or absolute religion absolute knowing anyways whatever so what we get then is not a conclusion that can be readily explained in the preface but the phenomenology of spirit and this is what i think to be probably the most brilliant part of it is that the very form of it itself mirrors or or in a, in some form or other tries to capture the essence of spirit which a preface cannot do because that would imply that the preface would have to do that as well the preface can't say spirit is the movement of the phenomenology of spirit because then the preface is useless like what is the point of that uh, you would need the uh, actual phenomenology of spirit to experience that it would be like a just a total um it, it wouldn't actually capture that reality of the book now, unless, of course, the preface itself was meant to be a part of this movement, it is very much a part of the experience of the phenomenology of spirit. I don't imagine anyone would even think about reading the phenomenology of spirit without reading that preface. And maybe that is in the case of the phenomenology of spirit with the universe coming into the realization of its own self-consciousness or of beings coming into relationship with its own, their own self-consciousnesses. And Hegel, within the phenomenology of spirit, reflecting upon his own place as an author in the preface, perhaps then the preface is part of the phenomenology. It is not an addition to it. It is very much one with it. And so we must ask if they are not that different, if they are actually, they resemble one another, if they are part of the same thing, why then the distinction at all? And the distinction is then born out of a desire in the history of philosophy to create these to create these distinctions between uh, a, the supplement and the the real thing, the true core of the thing, in order to give that sense of solidity, in order to give that sense of realness to the real thing. And one of the ways that I like to think about this, and it, it's kind of a silly example, is in the case of like video games. And if anyone's ever played a video game. Uh, you'll understand what I mean. And if you've never played a video game, you'll still understand what I mean. But a video game normally involves what's called the main story. And, you know, you can pursue this main story as much as you like, but you will often be confronted with side stories or side plots or whatever. And you can pursue those if you want. And who's to say that the side plot cannot itself be as meaningful or as full as the main story itself? Could it be that the very existence of the side plots are meant to conceal the fact that the main plot is itself only a side plot to another main plot. The main plot being your life, you know, that you're putting on hold to go and play a video game. And that's just one way I like to think about it and to explain it to people in what I think is fairly easy terms, where the phenomenology of spirit here in relation to a preface that is taken as addition or supplement is meant to hide the fact that the phenomenology of spirit is itself derivative to spirit itself which is itself derivative to um i don't know idos and play whatever to, to anything else which is itself derivative to the very words meant to describe it which is itself derivative to the word of god you know and so on and what you get is this endless chain of signification where you know to follow it through the word of god is only mediated through uh religion only exists in certain religious texts and what we have is this endless circle of recognition nothing actually having being that total totalizing finished point no one's written the last book or the first one really now before proceeding it's important to discover discover to discuss the title of the book here dissemination now dissemination is related to and contrasted with polysemy or polysemy polysemy now polysemy I, you know, I should always look this up before I start recording, but it, you know, I'm reading this and I'm like, yeah, in my brain, I'm like, yeah, I can know, I know how to pronounce that. No problem. Anyways, polysemy refers to how a word can mean de many different things. So for example, watch, a watch can be something you wear on your wrist to tell the time, but watch could also imply what you do with your eyes. You watch something. 
and you can be, you know, you can further taxonomize that. Watching can assume very different forms. Watching can be a form of surveillance. It can happen in leisure and so on. That's not really the point. My point is that words can have many different meanings. Now, in the case of polysemy, polysemy, <laughs> what you have is all of these meanings essentially being related to a single term that grounds them and gives them a kind of understanding. Now, by contrast, Derrida gives us the term dissemination to say, to imply more of an explosion of possible meaning, where even the words I have just used to describe a watch are themselves broken up into many different possible meanings and understandings. Each one of the listeners, each one of you have had a different mental image pop into your mind about what a watch is, the physical thing, versus the act of watching or being a watch or, or whatever. And so what we get there, what we get there is a, a, the, really the description of the impossibility of grounding meaning in any given word or in language, because it always only refers to other words, to other meanings. Whereas in the case of polysemy, polysemy, <laughs> I'm just going to have to laugh every time. It only points to that single word that stands in for many different things. So they do resemble one another. And Derrida isn't trying to uh, necessarily proffer up dissemination as the truth of all things. His point is that the very truth is that this truth is always going to be evading us. So dis dissemination explains and is really the condition for the never settling on meaning. What is also called différence, where différence referring to both to differ and to defer, that is how two different words are different from one another, yet their meaning is deferrable from one to the other. In the case of speech and writing, speech defers its meaning onto writing in that it uses writing as a necessary antithesis to give it a kind of meaning, to give it uh, its, I guess, privileged place within, um, you know, within the history of philosophy. Now, for those that have been listening and might have a, maybe a pretty strong understanding of the history of philosophy, you might think that there's more to it than just being comprised of binaries. The binary between, say, uh, writing and speech, or between mind and body, or anything else, or between thesis and antithesis. In the case of thesis and antithesis, there is a third term, and that is synthesis. And this third term has often been this transcendental signified, this thing that stands outside of that binary, of the dyad, in order to give that dyad its kind of, uh, to concretize it, to really fix it in time and space. Now, what dissemination does for Derrida is it troubles this triangle, this, um, I guess, this trinity between and I'm just using this as an example between thesis, antithesis, and synthesis to open up a fourth term. And this fourth term is never defined, but it is opened up into indiscernibility. It is opened up into possibility, essentially. And the point of this is to open up the possibility, not of the triangle, but of the square. And in the square, one of the corners is going to be almost not hollow, but imagine that corner being like kind of transparent, opened up to possibility, almost opened up to other kinds of shapes. And the reason he does that is to imply the non, um, how you can't pin down meaning. It's always gonna be somewhere out there. No matter how much this triangle tries to, or this square tries to close in on itself to form the triangle, there's always gonna be the remnant of this opening opened up to somewhere else. And this extends also to like psychoanalysis resolved in, uh, you know, what any one of the terms there, like maybe castration or something that is meant to stand in for everything else or to be that of everything or like Oedipus as it, you know, Oedipus is described, especially in uh, Deleuze and Guattari's work. And so this, the image of the square, and this will come back very briefly toward the end of the book, the square is meant to trouble that closure of the three terms and uh, or the position of the transcendental signified in solidifying the other two terms as being their bedrock the one that kind of says oh there's the privileged term and the unprivileged one as though it's a natural distinction now here's a, another good point let's pop in an ad
Now, I hope that wasn't too that wasn't too uh, jarring for you. Um, I bet it was something fun. I'm sure it was something fun. Now, insofar as writing stands outside of speech, or the preface stands outside of the text, insofar as we've demonstrated that, and that in fact there is no outside to the text. And what he mean by he, what he means by that is he's not saying that like. Um, everything is naturally up for interpretation. What he is saying is that everything is read as text, essentially. There's nothing that is absolutely immediately communicated to us right to our like brains, as though like God just transmitted it to us and just put it put it into our minds. So he's saying that that is exactly the very nature of being human, if I can if I can say that. It is that. Uh, always being only confronted with supplement, only being confronted with text. So by saying there's nothing outside of the text, what he is saying is that, like in the case of the phenomenology of spirit, why can't it be that the phenomenology of spirit is itself the preface to the preface? Where in the preface, Hegel has this kind of moment of self-reflection. Perhaps that was necessary because, remember, the preface was written after the phenomenology of spirit. So why can't we understand it in terms of it being the preface to that preface? It was written after. So by virtue of that, it was a preface. It was a preface. It came before the, the face. It came before the, the text. So when he says that everything is text, I, and I think it's important to clarify this. He's not reducing everything to a textual imminence where suddenly we can just apply the tools we understand about uh, engaging with texts to everything else. His point is that insofar as the text in relation to something like speech implies an outsidedness or how the preface is seen as an outsidedness, he is saying that the entire uh, possibility of being or what it means to have interactions, to engage with language, representation, anything, is itself an engagement with outsidedness. There's never an engagement with a like, pure inside, a pure transcendent uh, thing. So we could very much change that sentence instead of there is nothing outside of the text because we are just talking not about textuality per se, but about the very logic of exteriority, of being outside, being an, an addition to, you know, not being part of. Because we can put it that way, we could change the sentence to, there is nothing outside of the outside. Everything is outsidedness. Or, to be even more cheeky, there's nothing outside of the preface. Everything is really prefaced to something else. Even the Big Bang as being a possible original point, implies that there were two floating molecules or whatever that bumped into one another. So even before the so-called original point, or the, the, I don't know, the origin of the universe had to have been something of to which that meeting of these two things that collided and produced the Big Bang, that is only a supplement. It is only an outside of those uh, two original cells floating around, or whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> someone someone explained to me how I misunderstood the Big Bang. I think the point still stands, but in any case, that's, that's that. So dissemination grasps, that is the term, not the, the book does this, but in any case, the term recognize everything, recognizes everything as being outside. That is always exterior to itself and to any opposites of it or anything else. It is in accordance with, or understands in Derrida's words here, the underivable repetition, the duplicity with nothing coming before it. So to engage with dissemination is to do away with what he calls a reassuring outside, you know, a thing that can ground a text, uh, to give the text uh, maybe a history, a politics, or like a sexuality, to say that, oh, we can understand this text because of X, Y, and Z factors, which is where I think so many people um, seriously mischaracterized Derrida, saying like, oh, uh, he's just opening up text to any kind of interpretation you want. Uh, you can just bring along your own history or you're just trying to diagnose texts to say that, oh, this is produced uh, because of these sociocultural factors or whatever. 
Derrida is not saying that. In fact, Derrida is saying that that is going to greatly limit our understanding of what textuality is in a more abstract term. You know, he's not talking about like individual texts, even though he'll go on to do that. He's not trying to diagnose them and to understand why certain words are said. He is talking about the very play of words themselves in a much more abstract way. And we could think of this as well, like the very nature of textuality being, or this nature of outsidedness being our nature or our non-nature, to really be kind of Derridian about it. You know, we look at it through like the Christian tradition, where Christianity, or at least some strands of Christianity, viewed nature as being a book. You know, it was a book to understand God's divine intelligence or God's intelligent design. I should say. Now, that wasn't enough. In order to actually have the word of God, then there needed to be produced on text or in text something like the Bible, which is, uh, you know, being part of logos or really demonstrating logos, which is translates kind of literally to the word of God as, as um, a true full-fledged speech. It could only be represented through text, through the written word not through speech, which really um, challenges the idea of the, or the privileging of speech over like writing in that case. And even, even in Hegel, he kind of sought to do something similar with his encyclopedia as a way to like clarify the text that should really stand on their own, as a way to add to his text, but that is nevertheless extremely necessary. Where the encyclopedia, you know, as, a, as an extension of the greater logic of the phenomenology of spirit, actually completes that system, at least ostensibly. And in the case of the Bible, the Bible completes the book of nature, but it is itself just a book, which, you know, all Derrida is doing is being kind of coy and uh, disturbing these privileges. And that more or less covers this preface uh, as you have probably gathered so far, you know, given its length, it wasn't really a preface. Uh, it was very much a meditation on the nature of the preface. And I think Derrida tried to realize his own project, that is what he was describing, by making the preface part of the text here. Very much necessary. But, of course, you know, someone who's who knows this stuff real well would say, oh, well, these, you know, these are three essays in this book written at different times. Maybe the connection between them is is tenuous at best which I would agree with, but I think that that even contributes to undoing the very understanding we might have of a book, where these three texts written at three different times can come together to comprise a book. It's almost like three exterior things coming together to comprise that believed interior thing, that full-bodied text, which then is undone and revealed to be itself textual, revealed to be its, or sorry, revealed to be itself uh, an outside a supplement, and so on. And yeah, uh, I hope that you're able to get something out of that. I know that it, most people will be interested in the next episode talking about Plato's pharmacy, uh, and just hold on, we'll get there. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick out of it. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.